Good afternoon. Welcome. I'm Emma Dench. I'm the Dean of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, and I am delighted to welcome you all to Harvard Horizons, back live here in Sanders Theatre for 2022. <laughs> In just a moment, I will be introducing you to our ninth class of Harvard Horizon Scholars, PhD students selected in a fierce competition from across the 57 programs that GSAS proudly oversees across the entire university. Each scholar will perform a sort of tightrope walk. They will have just five minutes to share with us their own highly original, cutting-edge research in terms that all of us can understand, no matter what our background is. And they will make it look easy. Whoa. <laughs> so, it's time to introduce our 2022 Harvard Horizons Scholars and their fields of study. And they're going to wave when I say their name, Vanessa Braganza English. <laughs> Harim Wan, Biological Sciences in Public Health. <laughs> Hannah Cohen, Art, Film and Visual Studies. <laughs> Nicolò Foppiani, Physics. Karina Matthew, English. <laughs> Chika Okafor, Economics. <laughs> and Juliana Garcia Mejia, Astronomy. <laughs> So now let's enjoy the presentations. Are puzzles, a game just like any other game. Well, in Renaissance England, the game was on. The 16th and 17th centuries saw a revolution in cryptography unparalleled until the code breakers of World War II. This was a time when kings and queens had to guard against vultures at their backs, for between themselves and rival claimants for the throne, there lay a precipice over which they could fall all too easily. The rise of state secrecy created a game of survival which turned on people's ability to conceal sensitive information in secret symbols, a practice known as ciphering. The Renaissance presents us with a paradox. Symbols and ciphers had the power to liberate people's voices by locking them up. There is perhaps no better example 
than Mary, Queen of Scots. For nearly 500 years, history has regarded Mary, Queen of Scots, as a tragic victim of fate. Betrothed at the age of one, her third husband assassinated her second husband before kidnapping and marrying her. Betrayed and imprisoned for 19 years by her cousin and rival, Elizabeth I, when she fled to her for help. And finally executed in 1587. But that's not the end of the story. As Mary herself would write, in my end is my beginning. So let's begin at the end. During her nearly two decades long imprisonment, Mary was anything but silent. She filled the world with words, words not only written, but painstakingly embroidered. Words that wove her story and tried to change it unsuccessfully. But these words have gone largely unheard. The reason? They're enciphered. Mary produced this piece of embroidery towards the end of her nearly two decades long captivity. The central monogram is a cipher that decodes to the names Elizabeth and Mary. The Latin motto around the border, Artiora sunt virtutis vincula quam sanguinis, translates to the bonds of virtue are tighter than those of blood. Elizabeth would actually pretend to be helping Mary, even as she imprisoned her. But the trampled Scottish thistle underneath that massive, monstrous monogram tells a different story, Mary's story, that even through Elizabeth's thin pretense of being Mary's ally, she was in fact trampling her underfoot. She was betraying a kinship tie. Mary produced this embroidery towards the end of her imprisonment, but she had, in fact, been dealing in ciphers from the very beginning. During this time, she was also sending enciphered letters left and right to Scotland and France. These ciphers, these letters, made use of a simple substitution system. That is, one symbol for every letter of the alphabet. Here is one of the earliest, written in the second year of her imprisonment to the Scottish Bishop of Ross, written in cipher and also written in Middle French. In it, Mary recounts a kind of mutual interrogation between herself and her jailer, Sir Francis Knollis, in which she plies him for information about the ongoing legal proceedings against her in, for complicity in her third husband's assassination of her second husband. Sir Francis Knollis pretended yesterday that he had learned nothing, yet well I know that if he had something that could benefit me, he would not advertise it. On the contrary, he wishes to draw the worms from my nose to draw my secrets out. And for that, I have answered him as little as possible to keep him in suspense and doubt. Besides being a colorful source of idioms, this letter reveals Mary to be an astute political chess player, well aware that her very survival depended on her ability to be several steps ahead of her opponent at all times, and that this necessary advantage hinged on her ability to conceal and reveal, and even solicit, sensitive information. These two examples barely scratch the surface of the unplumbed archive of Mary's codes. And Mary's story barely scratches the surface of the dangerous games that people were playing with codes in the Renaissance. At the same time, some cryptographers actually pretended to be sorcerers and concealed their codes and ciphers in fake spells, the better to keep their sensitive expertise under lock and key. This practice 
of hiding one plain text within another is known as steganography and is still used today. At the same time, courtiers and writers splashed ciphered monograms, much like Mary's, across the covers of books and wore them as jewelry. Ciphers teach us to search for the secret passageways and trap doors of history. And this is what I do for a living as a literary historian, or as I prefer to think of it, a book detective. <laughs> so here is my challenge to you. You were each given your own cipher wheel as you arrived here today. <laughs> and the coded message on the screen behind me can also be found in your programs. Most people think of history as something that exists within the covers of books or through the glass cases of museums. But what does it say that someone as well known as Mary Queen of Scots, whom I'd be willing to bet everyone in this room has heard of, has managed to go unheard? This history invites us to step inside. And so I invite you to do what I do for a living. Cast yourselves as the detectives. Step inside the Renaissance's game of masks and shadows, and let's see if you too can crack the code. Because Mary's story is not the end. Ciphers teach us that what appears to be the last word on a subject or a person and her voice may well be just the beginning. Mycobacterium tuberculosis causes tuberculosis, a devastating disease which presents a pressing global health threat. Every year, there are 10 million new cases of TB, and it claims over a million and a half lives, making it one of the world's leading infectious killers. In the past 200 years, TB has caused over a billion deaths, vastly more than the infectious specters of the past many are more familiar with, such as smallpox or the bubonic plague. The advent of antibiotics in the early 20th century was an incredible advance that has saved an astonishing number of lives. But decades of using the same antibiotics and having few new treatments has resulted in the ever-increasing spread of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, or MDR-TB. Now, there are over a half million new cases of MDR-TB every year, and it has only a 56% cure rate, and that is if patients have access to the full course of treatment. And this involves taking four or more antibiotics over the course of two years. Our lab focuses on creating new knowledge that we hope ultimately addresses this problem and crushes the scourge of tuberculosis. The old ways of making antibiotics really rely on gumming up proteins or molecular machines, preventing the cell from completing some critical activity, such as multiplying or making energy. Now, if we were to liken a bacterial cell to an electric pencil sharpener, this would be like jamming silly putty in the blades, preventing them from working. Because the old ways of making antibiotics had stopped giving us powerful new drugs, we looked to our colleagues developing cancer drugs to see if we could maybe find some new strategies. What if we could get the pencil sharpener to chew up its own wiring? What if we could somehow turn bacteria against themselves? This approach is called targeted protein degradation, and it employs a two-headed molecule called a degrader. These molecules are bispecific, 
They're sticky on both ends for different proteins, and it brings them close together. This results in the flagging of a target protein with a garbage label that then directs it for destruction by the proteasome, which is just a molecular garbage disposal that cells have to recycle old proteins. The goal here is to use a normal way of clearing out old proteins and redirecting it to destroy ones that are causing disease. Yet we haven't seen this approach tried before in an infectious disease. In our development of a TB degrader, one side would bind to a protease. This is just a different type of garbage disposal that bacteria have. The other side to some essential TB protein, a target protein that is critically important for bacteria to live. This degrader would bridge both proteins, resulting in the target protein being cut up. In this way, we would be forcing the bacteria to destroy the very things they need to survive. My first step was to create a proof of concept system where we could test whether we could in fact deliver bacterial proteins for self-degradation. As I was in the early stages of my dissertation and we were really pioneering this new approach in bacteria, we wanted to figure out how we might get the system to work in a model of TB before diving right in to making a molecule. To do so, I fused the target protein and the protease with the partner A and B proteins. Now these proteins get forced to stick together in the presence of a molecular glue I'll call inducer. The idea here is that adding inducer will deliver the target proteins right to the protease, resulting in its destruction. I created bacterial strains that have the target protein tagged with the partner A and glowing GFP proteins. When we add inducer, the cells on the left would not deliver the target protein to the protease, but the cells on the right would. With GFP, we can measure levels of the target protein in the cell you know, using a microscope. And so behind me is a microscopy video of bacterial cells multiplying. And where the cells are glowing bright green, there's plenty of that protein around in the cell. We can see that over the course of 12 hours, there is destruction of the target protein and the GFP tag only when it is delivered to the protease, resulting in loss of GFP signal on the right. This was fantastic news, as it showed us that, in fact, we could target bacterial proteins for self-degradation. The next question was, could we kill bacteria by targeting the right proteins for self-degradation? We've since found that targeted self-degradation of an essential cell membrane protein is able to restrict bacterial growth. We can see on the right that when we are targeting this membrane protein for destruction, there is profoundly less bacterial growth on petri dishes compared to when we don't. This was exactly what we wanted to see. We've also found that targeted self-degradation of an important RNA production protein is able to make bacteria more sensitive to the antibiotic to which TB strains are most often resistant. We can see on the right in blue that when we're targeting this RNA production protein for destruction, we require around three times less of a specific antibiotic to arrest growth compared to when we don't. Altogether, these data suggest that we could make a degrader that might kill TB outright or could combo with old antibiotics, perhaps against drug-resistant TB strains. My next steps are to search for molecules from which we can create our degrader and then take it through the lengthy drug development process. My dream is that we will be able to create a targeted degrader antibiotic that is powerfully effective even against multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. My dream is that we will save millions of lives and make our world a healthier place. In October 2007, the Colombian artist Doris Salcedo set a crack down the center of the Tate Modern. 
The crack, called Shibboleth, quite literally broke the museum in two. It took a stab at an institution with deep historical ties to British colonialism, as well as a long history of overlooking artists like Salcedo, who, at the time, was only the second female artist and the first artist from the Global South to ever be invited to be, produce new work for this particular space. Salcedo's proposal was conceptually a radical one, but it came with a major hitch. No one could figure out how to do it. Cutting directly into the concrete floor of the building was out of the question, as it stood to compromise the structural integrity of the museum. But so was the next obvious alternative, laying a cracked concrete slab over top the floor, as this was so transparent in the method of its staging that it stood to compromise the effect of the work on the viewer. In the lead up to the exhibition, Salcedo and her team worked for weeks on end, to no avail, to try to figure out how to break the tape. And in the end, the person who figured out how to do it was none other than an engineer by the name of Stuart Smith, who worked for the very same company that had engineered the building in the first place. Shibboleth is a fascinating work of art, and it exemplifies something crucial about contemporary art more broadly. This is an artwork that is inextricable from the technical feat of its production. The reason this work works is because Smith engineered it with such care and finesse that his contributions entirely disappear into the fabric of the work itself. We often think about art in romantic terms, as something privileged and pristine, something removed from the fabric of everyday life. But the fact is, it's anything but. It's technical. In my research, I look at the ways in which technical specialists, technical systems, and technical knowledges invisibly proliferate the world of contemporary art. And the reason why I do this is to explore this ideological tension between the idea of art and its construction. The first focus of my research is technical specialists, in particular, the figure of the engineer. All appearances to the contrary, museum and gallery spaces are highly technical environments. In order to meet the conservation standards of historical works of art, as well as the display requirements of more contemporary artworks, many of which are quite large or technically complex, museums must have in place cutting edge mechanical systems to regulate heat and relative humidity, lighting systems to light galleries without exposing artworks to harmful wavelengths, and structural systems able to support the unusual point loads of heavy artworks. And on top of all this, all of these systems have to be so carefully integrated with one another that they can be entirely concealed within the space itself. This work is done by engineers, and in particular, the engineers of one company, the London-based firm, Arup. On this world map, each glowing dot corresponds to just one of the many, many museums that Arup has engineered. In my research, I examine what the complexity of engineering art entails in the specific case study of the Tate Modern. Drawing on archival materials, as well as extensive interviews with engineers themselves, what I argue is that these engineers aren't just making calculations. They're really setting in place the very conditions of what contemporary art is and what it can become. They're thinking to themselves, OK, I have to design a museum that will be able to stand the test of time that will be able to exhibit artworks that are so new, they haven't even been imagined yet. And then, they're basically putting on their art history hats and mining art's history to make determinations about what contemporary art is and how it's evolving, and then baking those projections into the museums that they design. In this way, just as the display requirements of past works of art come to inform the technical design of new museums, so do the technical conditions of display come to inform the parameters for the evolution of new art. If we think about museums as machines for art, machines have many parts or systems. And one of the most important systems that any museum has is its wall system. 
The white cube is the paradigmatic modern and contemporary exhibition space. It's white, it's skylit, it seems almost like a sacred space. It's why, by the old joke, you walk into a modern art gallery and you think the fire extinguisher is a work of art. Art seems like art, like something sacred and timeless, because it's shown in this particular type of space. An unusual aspect of this architectural typology, though, is that from the start, these spaces that are meant to convey an eternity of display are, in fact, entirely temporary. They use mobile and temporary wall systems to reconfigure spaces anew for each new show. And the reason why this matters is because contemporary art is art that's new and always changing. And so museum and gallery spaces have to be able to spatially accommodate this sort of temporariness and flux. In my research, I chart a history of museum walls and wall systems, which, as you can see, can be surprisingly technical and are always idiosyncratic to their respective institutions. And I look at them as technologies by which museums negotiate this essential tension between the idea of art on the one hand, which is upheld by the white cube and its pretense of permanence, and on the other hand, the practical requirements of exhibiting art that's new and always changing. The final focus of my research is technical knowledge, a ubiquitous presence throughout the world of contemporary art, albeit a way of knowing that stands at a profound distinction from how art is conventionally understood. We often think about art as something that's visual. You go to a museum, for example, to look at art. But contemporary art can confound even the most astute powers of visual analysis. What makes a pile of wrapped candies or a trash bag covered canvas art are concepts, ideas, and academic frameworks that theorize these objects as art. One of the central sites I look at in my research is the Walla Walla Foundry in eastern Washington state. The Walla Walla Foundry is one of the world's largest commercial producers of large-scale contemporary art. It makes artworks such as these, which can sell for upwards of a million dollars a piece. On site at the Foundry, workers come to know art not by reading about it or by studying it, but by making it, by direct technical engagement with art itself, by molding it, modeling it, casting it, welding it, painting it, crating it, accruing a substantial, if pretty unusual, knowledge of art in the process. Drawing on extensive interviews with workers on site, what I argue is that contemporary art is sustained by two very different ways of thinking, and that the technical knowledges that materially sustain art might actively contest, if not outrightly critique, the more academic frameworks that conceptually sustain it. To take stock of the techniques of arts production and display is to confront the compli compli complex ways in which the concept and vision and value of art are all quite literally constructed by persons, systems, and knowledges that don't fit naturally within how we are taught to think about art or how we experience it in a gallery setting. Our contemporary cultural landscape is indelibly shaped by non-cultural actors. And these actors don't make art any less fascinating or beautiful or important, but they do make it more complex in ways that demand we rethink its place in the world around us. What can you see in this picture? Someone might think it's abstract painting. Someone might recognize a picture from a video game. But what it is, it's physics data. It's the type of data I analyze in my research every day. I welcome you to step into some of the work I do as a particle physicist in my quest to discovering new particles and understanding more of our universe. 
The blue color in the background of this picture represents our detector full of atoms. A neutrino, a subatomic particle that is almost invisible, enters the detector from the left and suddenly collides against an atom. As a result of the collision, two new particles are created and their traces are captured by our detector in what it looks like a photograph. Neutrinos, aside for this very rare collision, are invisible to light, are invisible to us. And this is why this word might be unfamiliar to many of you. Neutrinos, invisible, but everywhere. When marveling at this beautiful picture of the night sky, we cannot see all the neutrinos that are surrounding these galaxies. We are immersed in a sea of neutrinos. Think that right now, in this box, there are about 10,000 neutrinos. And together with uh, deciphering the message that Vanessa left you, I'll leave you as a homework to compute how many neutrinos are with us tonight in Sanders Theater. You'll be impressed. <laughs> and if you're curious about where neutrinos come from, where there are so many processes that produce neutrinos, but you don't need to go very far, the nuclear reactions happening inside the core of the sun produce so many neutrinos that every second, each of us is crossed by about 10 billion neutrinos coming from the sun. Neutrinos are now all the same. We currently know about three different types called electron, muon, and tau. And don't worry about these words. I'm gonna refer to them by these colors for simplicity. But also, if you are puzzled by these symbols, as with many other elementary particles, we refer to them in Greek letters. The difference between the neutrinos is in the particle that are created during their collision with atoms. For example, in the case of electron neutrinos, electrons are created from their interactions. And this was also the case of the first picture I showed you today in the, at the beginning of the presentation. Muons and taus are just two of your cousins of the electron. And this is how we can distinguish the different neutrinos. But this might not be the end of the story. There might be a new type of neutrino. It would be called sterile neutrino because it will not collide at all. It will have no associated particle. It will be entirely invisible to us. And the goal of my research is to find it. <laughs> <laughs> but how do you go ahead and find an invisible particle? Well, we need to use another interesting property of neutrinos. They change type. So let's zoom out and imagine an experiment to help you understand what I mean. At the Fermi National Laboratory, close to Chicago, Illinois, they have an artificial beam of neutrino. Let's imagine to point it towards us here in Cambridge, about 1,400 kilometers away. The beam is engineered so that it contains only the yellow type. But as neutrino travel towards us, they change type, following what it looks like a wave-like pattern. That means that if you were to detect the neutrino beam at the very beginning, you'd only measure the yellow type. Then farther down the line, most of the neutrinos would turn green, and one out of 10 would turn red, and the pattern would repeat in a cyclic way. This phenomenon is called neutrino oscillation. It can depend on many different factors, and it can produce many different patterns. But what I want you to take away now is that this transformation happens in a cyclic way and over hundreds of kilometers for this neutrino beam. So how does this help us find the sterile neutrino? Well, if neutrino 
if neutrinos can transform into each other, then perhaps they can also transform into the sterile neutrino. And this is how we might be able to detect its presence. The difference is that this time, instead of, uh, instead of inducing a transformation over hundreds of kilometers, uh, the transformation would happen over hundreds of meters. And this is why we need to zoom into the lab. And despite you might only see some vegetation, um, buildings and roads underground, a complex set of accelerators channels particles and produces beams of neutrinos, which are then measured about 500 meters away by our detector. Because we're looking at such a short distance, neutrinos would stay yellow from production to detection. But if we see a red signal that should not be there, well, we need an explanation. The explanation would be the presence of the sterile neutrino. The yellow would turn into blue, the sterile, and then into red. Hence, detecting the red would make prove the existence of the sterile neutrino. What would be different this time is that instead of once every 10, it will be one in a thousand, making the task quite more ambitious. But the, the, the images captured by our detector allow us to distinguish the two species. In this example, we can match this showery profile to the profile of an electron while the straighter one to the profile of a muon. And detecting electrons and muons allow us to tell the species of the incoming neutrinos. But remember, this is only once in a thousand. And for this reason, we need to collect and analyze hundreds of thousands of these pictures. And this is what I do in my research. I analyze complex and large data sets where these images are converted into numbers, and I write complex algorithms to try to classify the two species and find evidence of the sterile neutrino. But why am I doing all of this? <laughs> <laughs> why am I even embarking on this complex task? <laughs> if you think that results are still inconclusive, well, the payoff could be enormous. If discover the sterile neutrino would mean so much more to physics than simply discovering a new particle. It could make us progress significantly into answering some of the most fundamental open questions in physics. All the matter we see, from us in Sanders Theater, to the solar system, to the galaxy, to all the neutrinos around us, it's only 20% of the total matter in the universe. The rest is in the invisible form that we call dark matter because we don't know what it is made of. Perhaps the sterile neutrino could be our link, our connection between our world and the realm of dark matter. And this is only one of the many open questions that the sterile neutrino could help us answer. And I'm sure the journey towards its discovery will be full of surprises we can't even imagine. Thank you. question is as old as science itself, but recent developments in observational technology and the biological sciences suggest that we are at the dawn of an interstellar interspecies age. 
when in 2017, this mysterious interstellar artifact hurtled through our solar system, it sparked a contentious debate as to whether we had, in fact, made contact. The object named Oumuamua was difficult to define, to label as that which had been seen before, and it unleashed a fury of interest in its uncanny and chilling nature. This, question, this object prompted a new question, what if? Science fiction is one of the primary ways we, inqu we inquire into a question such as what if? And it is the tool that I use in my research. As a scholar of contemporary literature and fiction, I am fascinated by the disruption that Oumuamua caused. My dissertation looks at contact fiction in film from the 1960s to the present day that refused to give us easy answers about the extraterrestrial, forcing us to think flexibly and nimbly about relationships between human and non-human actors. But not all contact fiction are made alike, and we need to be selective in which we look to as sources of inspiration or even as models. Many science fiction contact stories project the human onto the extraterrestrial, viewing the aliens as conquerors, agents of enlightenment, or metaphors for race relations. The works I look at undermine this anthropocentric, by which I mean human-centered bias. They place human investigators in a moment of suspended understanding in which the extraterrestrial is given agency to speak, to be understood on its own terms. Such contact stories shift the focus away from what if, which presumes that we know what we're looking for, to ask a far more interesting and complicated question. What is this? Let's take a look at some examples. You might be familiar with Denis Villeneuve's Arrival, which envisions contact as an exercise in alien linguistics. Our heroine linguist is surprised to discover that learning an alien language reprograms the human mind's ability to perceive time. Or consider Boris and Arkady Strugatsky's novel, Roadside Picnic, which sees contact as an archaeological endeavor, as humans scavenge the landscape for incomprehensible alien artifacts. These stories decenter the human perspective by placing extraterrestrial agency front and center. Aliens transform humans, disrupt landscapes, and choose one to reveal or obscure their true nature. Another telling example is Jeff Vandermeer's novel, Annihilation, in which an inexplicable entity arrives on Earth and begins complicating distinctions between human and non-human, between life and matter. When an expedition is sent into the mysterious Area X, they find that the organism refuses to be defined. It appears not as one organism, but by mutating other creatures. It begins to mimic its surroundings as if sculpting itself from the nearby biological matter. It even develops human brain cells and learns to write, leaving messages in English that can be read but not understood. This organism has its own logic, and this logic can only be grasped by human investigators through direct experience with the entity itself. The novel suggests that in pursuing the question, what is this, we come out on the other side as something more than human. To pursue this question is to realize that we are part of the answer. What I hope you take from this talk today is that the works of our imagination 
are a lens, as powerful as that of any telescope, that filters what we look for in the night sky, what we see, and what we choose to label as alien or not. Becoming aware of this is critical because how we define the parameters of the extraterrestrial may mean the difference between making contact and staring blindly into the night. Our first task in imagining extraterrestrial contact, then, is to critically assess the vantage point from which we begin our imaginings. But more importantly, Understanding how we imagine the non-human is critical in a time of global ecological crisis. In many ways, we are blind to the voices of intelligence and life forms on this planet. Consider, for example, recent research into the life of trees, which has revealed intricate networks, activities, even relationships that permeate across forests and ecosystems, even as these ecosystems are being destroyed. To ask whether we are alone is to embark on a journey and an investigation into the nature of our universe and our planet. It is to inquire into the relationship between the human and the non-human, into questions as old as civilization itself. But in the search for life, detection is just the beginning of the journey. And the moment of encounter raises questions that science alone cannot answer. Thank you. Let's turn the clock back to the end of the 20th century, to the 1980s and 1990s, to the time period when many elected officials fought to be viewed as tough on crime. This time period coincided with the war on drugs, with the crack cocaine epidemic, with the rapid expansion in the US prison population by over 600% from 200,000 in 1970 to 1.3 million in 2000. Against this backdrop of rising incarceration, local prosecutors represented one of the most influential actors in the US criminal justice system, sometimes called district attorneys or DAs for short. Local prosecutors had nearly unfettered authority on whether or not to charge a suspect with the crime as well as on the collection of crimes to charge them with. They are also a key factor in plea bargaining. Despite what we learn from TV shows, the vast majority of people convicted of crimes never saw a judge nor a jury trial to determine guilt. Instead, they pled guilty with the terms of their plea deal brokered by the prosecutor. In a district or county, the DA leads the entire prosecutor's office. And in these offices, DA set the tone, they set the culture, they set the policy. And in nearly all US states, DAs are elected. Given the fact that DAs are elected, and given their extreme influence over the US criminal justice system, I set out to understand whether DAs were also influenced by this desire to be viewed as tough on crime during this period in our nation's history, this period of rising incarceration? Did DAs respond to political incentives? Were more people put behind bars? Did we collectively deviate from justice? I am a trained lawyer. I am also an economist trained in the PhD program here at Harvard. 
And so I used the tools of economics, modeling, econometrics, to explore foundational matters of justice, with one area being criminal justice. To embark on my study, I first collected data from the National Corrections Reporting Program, which includes millions of convictions at the height of the rise in incarceration. I then compiled a new comprehensive data set on the political careers of all DAs in office during this period in our nation's history, from roughly 1986 to 2006. As a scholar in law and economics, I then applied a sophisticated econometric model to this criminal justice data. In doing so, I found that the level of criminal sentencing increased leading up to the timing of the DA election, which is the dashed vertical line on the graph. This graph will show property offenses, and the units are in log points, which approximates a percentage change relative to the time period two years prior to a DA election. Each dot represents an estimate for the corresponding month, and the blue line approximates the best fit of the overall trend which shows an increase in sentencing leading up to the DA election. Now, when we look at all criminal offenses bundled together, we see a similar trend persists. For both the admissions rate and the total month sentence per capita, the level of sentencing increases leading up to the timing of the DA elections. Now, this analysis suggests that there is a relationship between the timing of DA elections and the level of criminal sentencing which suggests that DA practices may be responding to public sentiment. What I next set out to understand is whether the level of criminal sentencing is related to the public's racial sentiment in a particular county. This map shows an estimate of the pro-white racial bias by county based on something called the IAT assessment. Darker red areas correspond with more pro-white racial bias. My goal is to understand whether the level of psychological racial bias within a county is related to the racial bias in sentencing throughout the county. In the 1990 US population, the ratio of white to black members of the population was seven to one. Yet when it comes to the prison population, the ratio of white to black prisoners was seven to seven or one to one. So in short, there were disproportionately more black prisoners. Now, let's take these seven prisoners and assume they relate to the lowest levels of pro-white racial bias. What I find is interesting. Although I find no relationship between pro-white racial bias and the volume of white uh, prisoners admitted to prisons, this is not the case for black prisoners. The greater the pro-white racial bias in a county, the higher the level of sentencing for black prisoners throughout the entire election cycle, which suggests that the psychological bias within a county may be related to the racial bias and sentencing throughout the county. So now, let's look at the evolution of public sentiment over time. As I mentioned earlier, in the 1980s and 1990s, there was a lot more talk about and perceived benefits from being a politician who was viewed as being tough on crime. According to the General Social Survey, which is a survey that measures public opinion over time, only after about 1994 did the fraction of the population who viewed courts as not too harsh begin to decline. In short, there was an evolution in public sentiment over the last 25 years or so, with more people viewing the court system as being too punitive. Now, this downward trend in public sentiment maps closely with the downward trend in the election year effects on the admissions rate during the same time period, which is the graph at the top right. So again, there appears to be a potential nexus between public opinion and criminal sentencing. So much work on criminal justice reform to date has focused on improvement to the system itself and to the laws that govern it. Yet my research suggests that focusing on hearts and minds, on shifting public opinion towards punishment, may prove influential in shifting sentencing outcomes and stemming mass incarceration. Achieving progress is not merely the individual project of politicians or policymakers or even DAs. 
Rather, achieving progress is the collective project of all of us as citizens, as Americans. Our challenge as a nation is to balance the concern for safety and security with the acknowledgement of the humanity of all people, including the incarcerated. Only then will we move past the simplistic, tough-on-crime rhetoric of yesterday, past the tragic dynamics of mass incarceration still evident today, to a brighter future, a better tomorrow ripe not only with more safety and more compassion, but also with more justice. As a kid growing up in Colombia, I remember running around the family's coffee farm surrounded by plantain palm trees and virgin forests. But what I remember most vividly were the evenings when my uncle would sit us cousins down to stare up at a sky teeming with stars. That is where I fell in love with the question that I intend to dedicate my life to researching. Is there life elsewhere in the universe? I consider us all here extremely lucky to be alive during a time where we have the scientific framework and technology in hand to make significant leaps in answering this question. But what exactly does it mean to search for life in the universe from the perspective of an astronomer? As it turns out, different astronomers will reply differently to this question, but to many of us, the first step in that quest consists of finding the nearest Earth-like planets to the solar system. That is, planets that have about the same size as our own, but that orbit stars other than the Sun. And the workhorse method by which we find those planets is known as the transit method. So I'm going to ask you all to put on your astronomer hats for a second and imagine that you're all observers trying to determine whether this star is orbited by a planet. If this star is indeed orbited by a planet and the orbit is oriented such that at some point the planet will pass precisely between all of you and the star, it'll generate a shadow. It'll block some of that star's light. Now in detail, if we look at the amount of light that we're receiving from that star as a function of time, you'll notice that in the exact moment that that star, that that planet passes in front of that star, there will be a dip in that light curve. That dip is the measurable quantity that we are after. And as it turns out, the smaller the planet, the harder it is to find. So finding an Earth-like planet around a star as large as the sun poses an immense challenge. But we can help ourselves. We can cheat just a little bit by looking for those same Earth-sized planets around the smallest stars in the universe, so-called red dwarf stars. In that case, the dip in the light curve would be, will be about 100 times deeper, making our task just a little bit easier. And this is exactly the task that I set out to do for my PhD. For my PhD, I set out to lead the construction of the Tierras Observatory, which is a new observatory located in Mount Hopkins, Arizona. And although it is a new observatory, we're actually reusing an old telescope that was built back in 1995, the year I was born. And this telescope is really old, so the first few years, we've spent a lot of time and effort rebuilding it and refurbishing, building it and rebuilding its control software. But at the end of the day, a telescope is a giant bucket. It's just that instead of collecting water like you'd usually do, you actually collect light. And in our case, our bucket of light is a primary mirror. And that primary mirror is a 51-inch primary mirror, tel primary mirror um, that is the main part of the telescope. But at the end of the day, like I said, that's just helping us collect the light. So I also spent a lot of time building a new and innovative instrument that sits right underneath that primary mirror and addresses some of the main limitations of today's best ground-based and space-based observatories in our line of work. And to tell you what is so exciting and innovative about our, our instrument, I'm actually going to take you on a journey through the whole telescope. So let's imagine that, you, that there's light 
coming from a nearby red dwarf star. And by nearby, I mean that light is going to have to travel something like 100 trillion miles to make it to the Earth and then make it to our primary mirror. And then after that light makes it to our primary mirror, it's going to bounce off to the secondary mirror. And then after bouncing off to that secondary mirror, it's going to make it down through the primary mirror hole. And after making it through the primary mirror hole, it's going to encounter the first element in the Tierra's instrument, a custom filter. This, built, this filter I designed and built, it's one of a kind, and it's built to only allow the wavelengths, the colors of light that are not affected by the atmosphere to make it through the system. And this is important because, as it turns out, the atmosphere is the greatest enemy to ground-based astronomy. After making it through the filter, this carefully filtered light is going to make it through a set of coded optics. And these optics allow us to increase the field of view of the telescope thereby allowing us to monitor many more stars. This is not unlike how that second and third cameras in your iPhone in your pocket right now allow for wider images to be taken. Finally, the arduous journey is going to be over at the CCD chip. That chip is going to convert all that light into a digital signal, data, that we can analyze in search of exciting discoveries. My amazing team and I have already spent countless hours designing and building this instrument in the lab to then pack the whole thing up and take it over to Arizona. In Arizona, we carried out a careful and detailed installation effort after which I spent entire days and nights aligning the telescope and overcoming all sorts of hardware and software problems. It has already been an adventure of the most epic proportions, and we've even had some eureka moments in the mix. <gasps> Look at your cluster. <laughs> oh my that, god! That, that, that 2000 was the right guess. <laughs> to that young Colombian girl that stared up at the sky from her, Colombian, from her family's farm, this first light image was a dream come true. But to the astronomer, this is only the beginning. And the data is coming in fast. We have the added advantage that every night of good weather is going to be dedicated to our experiments. And our telescope is led not by an observer that is a human, but in fact by a tireless robot that's observing night after night. I hope that all of you are as excited as I am about the future discoveries that our observatory will enable. We could find Earth-like planets that are small and temperate enough to sustain liquid water oceans and retain their atmospheres, but also moons and smaller bodies around those planets, which are crucial to understand their formation histories. All in all, these are all clues, pieces, ciphers in a much larger puzzle, but one that's going to get us closer to answering the ultimate question of whether or not we are alone in this vast universe. Thank you. Those are really, really, really hard acts to follow, and I bet, I bet, I will forgive you for being very, very disappointed to see me back on the stage, because it means that's the end of these fantastic pre presentations. Thank you all so much. Your extraordinarily lucid presentations are such a testament to the possibility of communicating very complex ideas in a clear and immediate way. And that's just so urgent and necessary for all of us in academia. And I'm sure the audience will agree, you made us feel smart <laughs> even better. Before we celebrate our Harvard Horizon Scholars one more time, I want to recognize a few of the many people who've made this program such a success. Shaoli Mang and Hisakuriyama, who first proposed the idea and launched the program. Thank you.
the generous GSAS alumni and friends who've made this program possible. Thank you. The faculty fellows for their outstanding guidance and mentorship of this year's scholars. Thank you. GSAS and Derek Box Centre staff, without whom none of this would happen. Thank you so much. And most of all, they're going to embarrass some people. Noel Bisson and Sheila Thomas from GSAS Academic Programs and Pamela Pollock of the Box Center, whose work with the Horizon Scholars from the very beginning of the program has enabled them to walk the tightrope, honing their research ideas, improving their presentation skills to explain their research to all of us. Thank you so much. And now, because I'm not going to let them go away yet, I'd like to ask our amazing scholars to come back onto the stage so we can celebrate you once more. scholars in the transept for a reception. Congratulations again, all our scholars.